Hey everybody, Noel Polanco with Home Quick and Yes Virtual, and I'm super excited to do our first um, kickoff attempt at me and my buddy Mike Stout doing a business and bros chatting podcast. <laughs> Mike Stout with NTN, please introduce yourself to the world or at least to our audience, however big it is. <laughs> All right. Hey, seven people out there. What's up? My name is Mike. No, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've been talking about this for, for a while and uh, we're, we're ready to uh, to do it. Um, you know, we're spinning names around, trying to come up with something. So hopefully you're going to see that when uh, when this thing goes goes live and, and uh, just look for more uh, more content. Looking forward to it. In terms of myself, I just, I'll tell you way too much in a little bit of time. Um, I'll, I'll cut you off when you go. Mm -hmm. You should, because you probably ought to just cut me off now. It's probably the best. Uh, in, in, uh, in, I was in college, and I thought, man, what a great way to meet people and have a place to live. I want to rent apartments. And so I started renting apartments. And long story short, after about a year, year and a half of that, two years, I don't know, whatever it was, I got burnt out. And I thought, you know, the phone, when it rings, I'm slamming it down or want to slam it down on you know, potential residents, uh, maybe I should go elsewhere. And I've been being recruited by this NTN thing that I knew because to date myself, we would take a fax cover sheet, you know, a piece of paper and stick what, it in the what is fax, fax? machine. What I is know, fax? I know, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Handwriting stuff, we did that too, write it, fill it out, boom, came back from this NTN thing, didn't know what it was. And here we are, fast forward, that was in the mid 90s and fast forward to what are we in? 20 February of 2023. Yeah. And here we are. We do uh, we do background checks just a different way. And uh um we're also uh rolling off uh another kind of uh sister company called True and Verified that does uh, a lot of ident identity authentication, instant uh, employment verifications, some other things that are coming along uh, pretty quickly here. So um <clears throat> If you want facial recognition, check us out. But no, go. Well, well, Mike, I know you. So this is how I met you is probably seven, eight years ago at a NARPM event. For mm -hmm. everybody out there that's not a property management nerd, that's the National Association of Residential Property Managers. And so check them out. So obviously we have a use as, as me um, running applications for people who want to rent our homes that we manage. So obviously we connected on, on that level and, and the fact that that's what you do is screening for residential. Uh, but I'm assuming, and I just never heard you talk about this, but you do, do you guys do background checks for like people that are doing new hires? What what, what are the reason would you be verifying somebody's identity? I mean, generally speaking, those are the two pieces of the puzzle. You know, we're not, we're not really looking to get in, in uh, involved with, uh, you know, that leasing uh, gal who wants to check out her uh, her date for the weekend, right? Okay. We want to stay away from that. But okay. yeah, looking for looking for a job, looking to place somebody, looking to uh, put so you do a short term. So you rental. do like employment background checks for people that yep. are hiring and do like somebody trying to rent a house or an apartment. Exactly. Okay. There's a little bit of, there are a few sort of differences, but at the end of the day, it's the same information we're talking about. Gotcha. So at least, uh, and we've seen, uh, Maybe you could tell me this. It seems like it goes in cycles, but I've been seeing more and more people talk about lately, um, not fake IDs, but they're doing a lot of fake pay stubs. And um, I, I know that you see the fake IDs. I don't look, I was a bouncer for a long time. People may remember Jackson's on third downtown where I was a bouncer and a DJ and a manager. We'll get into those in future episodes. But I remember I had a stack of IDs that I had collected. I believe it. We got paid like five bucks to keep up. So I was really good at, at taking those. Now, this is back in early 2000s, but I had to kind of have it in my hand and hold it for me to be able to tell it was fake. And a lot of times I just ask a basic question. One of my drinking stories is I tell people that the best one I ever took was instead of asking, you know, what's your zip code or what's your cross streets? I literally looked at a girl. She was trying to hide her face. I said, what's your name? And she, <laughs> responded, she responded, I don't even know. And I said, okay, I'll take that. you're out of here. So, so that's so at least for my experience, I had to like have it in my hand and and look at it, be able to see them in the eyes. How, mm -hmm. how are you guys like? What are your I mean, you, you don't have to get all the way down in the rabbit hole, but how do you spot a fake ID, especially when when you're not holding it in your hand? You no, know, when you're not, and, and frankly, technology's come a long, long way. Yeah. You know, back back in those days, you're right. You feel it, you kind of look at it, 
you know, just you're just doing it with experience, you're even better at it. It's kind of like well, and I and I can yeah. see their face, they're standing in front of well, there you go. And that too. You know, we don't have that. Uh one of the funniest things I keep seeing happening is let's say we're doing facial recognition, right? Yeah. Guess what? You're looking at your camera and your face. Well, if you've got your hair in your in your face, guess what's not gonna happen? Okay, why are they doing that? Well, I don't know. Do you think maybe they're hiding their identity? Right. But anyhow, back back to your point. Or if they got a hoodie on or a really low yeah, hat, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hat. Um, listen, you can't take a photocopy. I've seen this too, believe it or not. We had a, fo- a gal using a photocopy of her ID and she was holding it up to the screen to try to get it to the picture to take it. She couldn't figure out. I got her on the phone. What, what's going on? What, what do you mean? Oh, like you can't <laughs> trick. The system is designed to, to do this, to, to verify you know, your ID, for example, to verify right. facial recognition. And, and so it, it, there's lots of bottom line technology, right? And I'm not, I've got um, way off over there when we were talking about something over here. That's so okay. Reel me in as, as needed. Well, so the, so the facial recognition is one, but what if it's <laughs> like, um, I, I don't know, or I'm, I assume, obviously, of course it's happening. People are creating fake IDs, right? right? Creating them to try it. So I know they're creating fake pay stubs because there's a lot of, I think, easy tools now to kind of create these. Oh, but a fake yeah. ID has got to be a little bit harder to make. But if they're w- willing to go out and make a fake pay stub to rent a house, I'm sure they'll do a fake ID or they're using this fake ID for a lot of different things, check fraud and and stealing identities and all of that. So like, what are some of the ways that you catch it? Like, I've been a property manager for 16 years. Mm-hmm. Not looking at a picture of an ID that they've, you know, emailed to us. And then trying to match it up with their credit report and their pay stubs. There's only so much I'm going to know. Like, tell me, how are you guys figuring this out? How, how can you spot the fakes? You know, again, is it necessarily our eyes doing, <clears throat> excuse me, doing it? Not necessarily. You know, right. that's that first step, that point of the system. And the system is looking at these IDs. Does it have to be, you know, a, from the States? The answer is it does not have to be from the States. It can be an international um ID. And so we're getting into that as well. And then you start to, I mean, when you see these things, if you're collecting this, these points of data, when you're collecting their applications as well, just look at it. Now, I can't tell you, maybe you've heard me tell the story before, maybe you haven't. I still remember when I got a social security card written on notebook paper. I'm talking lined, wow, loose leaf, whatever they call it, notebook paper. And I, I kid you not, I think that this this applicant had just gone down the street to the local flea market. This was in uh, in Houston, in Texas, and so they're everywhere. Meaning the, the flea markets, right? It's just I think he thought he was good. Yeah, you know, and, and he didn't understand. Well, I laughed at him. Of course, I'm like, "Come on, what are we going to do with this?" Some people will do. They don't know. He, he didn't know what he was doing. But it's as easy as you know. There's a commercial that's been around for a while. Guys driving up to the local. Uh, you know, drive through, except the drive through is an identity uh, um, stealing operation. Right. Oh, you need a, you need a, what do you want? A credit report? You want a, you want a driver's license, the passport, uh, you know, whatever else they've got, they've got it all. And it's right there. Well, in the, movies, in the movies, they make it look pretty easy. Is it really <laughs> that easy? You just got It's really it. that easy. So I had a fake ID when I was at NAU that said I was from Michigan. Um, and one of the dudes in the in the dorm just made them, but that's when they were still laminated. Yep. So this is back in '96. I'm dating myself, which is fine. I'm a dude. <laughs> I, I don't care if you know how old I am. Uh, but you mentioned that you're from Houston. Just yesterday, side note: Houston was voted one of the top five dirtiest cities in America. Oh, you know what? <laughs> that's beautiful, right there. I wish I would see that because I would have brought it up myself. I've never been there. But there, there's uh, you know, there's places that just just happens. I mean, it's a big city. Yeah. You know, a big, big city. But back to that point. So obviously there's people that will create these for you. And then I'm guessing, you know, if it's part of what do they call it? The the dark web or the underbelly and uh, um, what do they call stuff you get illegally? The black market, right? So people that will sell you an ID will probably also help you with the pay stub and, and those. So what about, what are some of the ways you could spot if somebody's got a stolen identity? Like if you're running credit. Um, like it's, if I'm looking at a credit report, is there is there things that I should be looking for that might be red flags? You know, I think maybe we've talked about this as, as well before, maybe in a class or something. But 
it, it's really tough for screening companies to initially spot these fake identities being used. You know, because you're looking at a blank report. You know, applicants born and and you know, let's say the applicant's 20, 30 years old, let's say 25, 35 years old, things are all coming up blank. Probably there's an issue there. You, you know, let's say, oh, I don't have any good credit. Okay, well, you have bad credit. That creates a credit file. And if you look at somebody who's of age and they don't have a credit file, there's a reason why. But it, it's tough. You're looking at a bunch of, if you see a bunch of inquiries, if you see a bunch of authorized users, there's a reason for that. These are folks out there building these fake identities called CPNs. So, but, but, but hold right there. So <laughs> the top of the credit report is where it shows all the addresses, potential users, all of that stuff. Especially like, I remember one of the, the, the craziest ones I ran is a guy named Michael Jackson. That was his actual name. And there was, not kidding, 22 pages of sex offenders that were named Michael Jackson and not the one that we're thinking of. But uh, he was just like some old white guy and that happened to be his name. But it, that I, that was probably the longest credit report I've ever seen at the top where it had all these potential addresses and users. So is that kind of where you're saying we can see that? Kind of. So okay. that information, like what you're talking about is kind of what, what some of the screening companies out there do that don't review data. They just go, oh, Joe, John Smith, here you go. Here's your 15 pages of John Smith. You go figure it out. Right. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about the credit report is you mentioned at the top are all those addresses and things. At the bottom of the report is something called in file. And different bureaus may word it differently, but the bottom line is when was this credit file created? How long has it been in the system of the bureau? Right. And if that date is recent and the, the applicant is in their you know, 30s. Yeah. I mean, pick an age, right? There's yes. an issue there. And with that issue is probably what we're talking about now. There's somebody else. They're just saying, you know, the guy says, look, I'm John Smith. And really he's, I don't know. Um, Pick a Bob, name. <laughs> Smith, Pick a Bob name. Jones. I, I don't know. Right. Okay. I'm like, oh, I got a name and I better not say that name. So somebody will, won't like it. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. I, I, and I think you mentioned that in the, one of our last classes. So a lot of people that are trying to do this, that's one of the, the new tricks is just to see, okay, what's their age and does it match their credit profile and mm -hmm. how long they've been using it? I think that totally makes sense. Now, I know a lot of these younger kids, these Gen Zers and, and Gen Xers, anyway, millennials, a lot of them aren't buying anything. They're still living with mom and dad. So maybe right. they, they don't have established credit yet, but they've probably, you know, at least had a phone um, uh, or something like that. You know I mean? Everybody's cell phone plan automatically registers them on credit. They probably got a gym membership they don't use. I actually went today. Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I've, I've, definitely, work, I've definitely had a membership for a couple of years that I didn't use that was rolling on my credit. So, so we know that if they're, if they're at a certain age, you would expect that they've got something. It shouldn't be a three month old beginning use of credit. And then all of a sudden they're trying to rent a house or an apartment or something like that. Right. 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 Okay. And, the, and it happens. It's happening more and more and more. And, and you know, this whole the lockdowns and, and with everything else that happened with the lockdowns, we grew kind of farther apart from, from one another in, in terms of reaching out, shaking hands, those kinds of things. Sure. And people just are more willing to go um, and sly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Bob. How you, how you doing? I'm well, Bob. Look, like we, to... we, about two years before the pandemic, we closed our office and went totally virtual as a property manager. So we no longer have tenants come to the office. We don't have owners come to the office. Nice. We verify money and all that stuff. They get a lockbox code and they're able to access the property to get the key. Um, but we're using all kinds of stuff. Uh, selfie with their ID, um, pictures of the checks, copies of the receipts. You know, um, they're dropping everything in our mailbox store. So a lot of different ways that we're we're already not in contact. And then to your point, um, COVID showed us that we can work virtually, you know, yep. in a lot of different ways and still get the job done. Um, but also to your point, I mean, the whole reason your company is around is to make sure that you're not, you know, somebody's not slipping through the cracks um, and you don't want to be lackadaisical by doing this stuff virtual. Um, you almost have to be more precise in how you're confirming people's IDs and, and pay subs and all of those things. Well, you know, and that's, uh, and maybe this is a great segue into talking about virtual things, you know, because you've, you've got some virtual stuff going on yourself and you're doing pretty well with it. So. We 
We do. So we've got a virtual assistant company. We've got about 120, uh, maybe 140 virtual assistants at this point placed with mostly property managers across the country, but uh, really any business, any small business, especially that's trying to grow can use a virtual assistant for anything. So we also call them remote team members. So I always, when I'm trying to explain this to somebody, I say, raise your hand if you had employees that were working from home during COVID. Almost everybody raises their hand. Well, essentially that's what a virtual assistant can be that same thing. They could be answering phones. They could be doing admin work like invoicing. They could be doing any data entry, scheduling, any office type stuff that doesn't require somebody running around outside, you know, going to a house or seeing a client in person. So it could be pest control companies, plumbers, attorneys, um, you know, a- acting as your virtual receptionist, all of those types of things we offer. We've just been mostly in the property management space, but we're really trying to branch out. So thank you for that plug or segue so that I can plug that. Well, you know, we got we to gotta, gotta talk about all these things and, you know, what, what uh, maybe not to just go deep into it we will do that uh you know soon what what are some of the things that these uh these assistants will do or these what did you call them remote what was that, that was remote good. team member remote so team member that's good for some well, reason you know somebody decided virtual assistant was degrading somehow i, I don't know why <laughs> um it's just an assistant right so um jason my property manager so far he hasn't got mad that he's still called the property manager essentially that'll change he's a client connoisseur or something we'll we'll figure something out <laughs> Um, but yeah, a remote team member is the same thing. So it, that also kind of helps explain a little bit better to people like in real estate and property management, we know what virtual assistants are. Realtors and property management managers have been using them for years. We've been using them for over 12 for just for home quick for our property management company. Um, other companies, like when I go to a BNI group, I was recently visiting an 84 member chapter and I stand up and say, we offer virtual assistance the first week. They're like, huh? I mean, just confused faces besides the couple of the realtors that were in the room. So the next time I said it's remote team members. And basically what we're offering is offshore staffing. So my political views don't necessarily line up with outsourcing. However, um, this is a great way for us to grow, especially like we're in, we're in this weird stage of our country where people don't want to work. And they don't want to show up. And when they do show up, a lot of times they just suck, right? So uh, the people that we're hiring out of the Philippines and Mexico, most of them have graduated college. They want to work. We're paying them a really good living wage. So, you know, these some of them are young, but a lot of them have families and kids. And uh, many have graduated college or are in the middle of college. So we're finding good people to give small businesses staff at a much reduced price. So... I like to say, how would you like to be overstaffed and stay under budget? Um, so basically, we're just giving you more team members to uh, to get the work done. I mean, there's no reason you or I at our stage in our career should be entering a new customer into our software system, right? You and I should be out seeing people, shaking hands, being in front, those types of things. But there's always that entry-level position and that entry-level, you know, sometimes I call it the grunt work that needs to be done every day. Um, you don't need, I, like, I don't need Jason, my 10-year property manager, calling, sitting on hold with the utility company, meanwhile, putting in a new tenant into the system. He doesn't need to be doing that. I need him figuring out what's going on with this potential mold, this water leak. Right. You know, is this tenant getting evicted? Those higher level things. So it gives you a chance to bring somebody on at a lower cost and keep your high level people doing high level things. So how so- how is that for a good ramble? <laughs> That's good. That's good. So really what you're saying, if I, if I heard you right, is that there's not much they that your uh, remote uh, team members don't do. Right. So GK is the general manager of our, of our entire team. She started with us 12 or 13 years ago now by giving out lockbox codes and answering leasing calls. Okay. I mean, she, had, she had one task. We had 900 doors. So we had a lot of calls. Yeah. That's all she did all day was check ID, <clears throat> lockbox codes and schedule showings. Um, so she has gone from that, which is a very entry level task to now managing 140 team members. Um, nice. So we've also got some people that have been with us four or five years that still basically do admin or they do our application tenant screening. Mm-hmm. They chase documents, call people, 
uh, call landlords, you know, some of those things. So some people will stay in one task for a long time, but we've all worked with people in offices that are the same way. Right. Uh, my wife's been a nurse for 25 years. She's not a manager because she does not want to be a manager. She's a worker bee. So we find those. And then we also find people that, uh, that want to excel and the better you can train them, just like any employee, the more, the faster you bring them up, the more, um, the more responsibility you give them, the more opportunity they've got to grow. And GK is a shining example of that, at least for us. So Sounds like it. That, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, we don't want to make these episodes go too crazy long, right? Um, but since we don't know if we want to talk about food every episode or whiskey, um, or are, are you a whiskey or tequila guy, we'll, we'll get into all of that. So um, I don't know. My, I, right now I'm on kind of a Jameson kick just because it's Ooh. easy. Uh, but I like a, a beer and a shot, and then hopefully not too many of those shots while I'm out. <laughs> what was so? Have you had the uh, Jameson Black? Uh, J- yeah, I have. Okay. But what, are your, what are your thoughts? What do you just or just just Jameson? Well, I like I, you know usually the Black and the Private Reserves they're always better, right? Generally, um, but I'm just easy. I worked at a bar for a long time, so I became I hated to, I didn't want to turn into one of those guys that always orders. I, I hate to let me t- explain it two ways. I love when you have a great bartender that knows how to make a great cocktail. Yep. What I hate is going to the neighborhood bar and get, getting upset because the bartender doesn't know how to make a good drink. So when I'm there, I'm like, Coors Light, Jameson, let's make it easy. Got I didn't it. bother you. You didn't bother me. I'm happy. <laughs> you know, got it, got it, got it. But if you go to a place that's got a good bartender and will make you an awesome old fashioned and maybe smoke it or do something cool, oh, yeah, you know, then you're, then now you're talking. Then I'll drink some fancy cocktails. But um, so to my point, like the the private reserves and the blacks, those are all great. But usually, I, I like that at home with a cigar or something versus yeah, you know, trying to trying to way 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 overpay for that at a bar. You know, well, I asked about the black because we we bumped into it uh, in Vegas actually. Okay. I'm like, hey, you want to try this? And I'm like, sure. I didn't care. And, and I got the, the bill. And I was like, well, is this right? <laughs> like this, and I know you're upcharging me. It's Vegas, but this. And so I, I, I we got back and I, I got a bottle immediately. And I was like, huh, it's it, it's not it's not expensive at all. So yeah. I, anyhow, it's good well, stuff. But did you like it? It obviously wasn't worth the price in Vegas. Was it worth the price at home? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, and frankly, and frankly, it was worth the uh, the price in Vegas. It's just knowing that. You know, I thought but that whoa was, oh, that's it? And don't get me wrong. I don't want to spend money. I don't need to. But I was just shocked <clears throat> at well, the, the price point for what I perceived to be something better. Well, topic for another time, and that's the number Definitely. one. I hate Vegas. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, the last show I was there for a NERPM conference, I had oh, yeah. by myself twice at just the normal American place at the at, in, inside Paris. It was yeah. it was eighty bucks for me to have a meal and one beer, eighty dollars. So ouch. So we're going to Paris for a volleyball tournament in May. We'll have to have a. Well, I don't know. I, the food, I don't look, think so. The wings were good there, and I got like uh, what else did I have? I can't remember, but the food was decent. But it was eighty bucks. They weren't thirty dollar wings. <laughs> yeah, that's Vegas, like I said. Oh anyway. man, we could probably do an entire show. On Vegas trips and these these things, I'm guessing. Maybe well, we'll we should do, do that on this one, but we'll do like an after hours episode, right? Because I've got plenty of uh, <laughs> inappropriate Vegas stories. I've been there. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, there hey, may I, or may not be pictures of. Yeah, I think that's a good show for now, Mike. What yeah, you... let's wrap it. So when you guys see this, you saw the title, but we hope you check us out. Mike's contact info has been on this the whole time. My contact info has been on this. And what we really like to do is invite you to join us, right? So if you've got any interest in talking a little bit about your business and introducing, you know, again, our ever-growing fan base, which right now is at two, um, we would love to put you in front of people and hear what you've got to say. Mike? What he said. I'm not sure he wants to follow up with that. And until next time, we'll catch you guys later. All right. Thanks, brother.